Good evening, everyone. We'll go ahead and get started. If you would open your Bibles to Genesis 3, that'll be our main text for this evening. We're going to do an overview of Satan in one class, and I was going to jokingly throw out at the beginning, so where'd this guy come from at the beginning, but we're not, we're not going to get into the weeds like that during this study. We're going to try to stick to the spirit of the class, which is an overview of who he is, how he operates, and then what we'll hopefully do is have some time to meditate on his influence in our lives. So in order to get there, we're going to identify some of our preconceptions. When we hear Satan, what, what is it that's coming into our minds? And then I'm going to share some premises that I'm operating from for the rest of class. We'll discuss Genesis 3, and then Darrell was really helpful on Sunday in talking about how this character, the serpent, Satan, seems like he kind of disappears from the narrative in Genesis. But what I want to do is I want us to track his influence <coughs> by looking not just at specific stories, but looking at the narrative structure of Genesis. The serpent is still influencing people in Genesis. So we're gonna look at how is that happening, which will then lead us into meditating on how he's influencing us today. Because as it is in Genesis, it is in our lives. It is behind the scenes. It's deep within us where that influence is taking place. But before we get into that, let's pray together. Father, we love you, and we are thankful that you have called us to be a family here. We are thankful that you've called us into a family of believers that spans millennia. You have been so gracious and good to us, and we pray now that as we meditate on our adversary, that would always be undergirded by an understanding of your love, your grace, your power in delivering us from his influence. Father, help us tonight as we study. Keep us away from unhelpful speculation, but help us sit and meditate on your word in a way that empowers us, that emboldens us to take the gospel to this community. Father, be with each one of us now as we open your word. We pray this through Jesus' beautiful name. Amen. All right, so this was up at the beginning of class, before class started, and I want you to do this. If you want to grab your phone, open up the notes app, jot it down on a piece of paper, I want you to write down a single sentence definition or description of Satan. Write it down, get it on your phone, get it in your mind. When you hear the word Satan, when you think about who Satan is, what comes to your mind? And then as you work on that and as you jot that down, I want you to keep that in mind as we walk through this study. So what are we bringing to the table when we're thinking about Satan? When we come to biblical topics, we should be in the habit of interrogating our presuppositions, our assumptions, and that might be especially important for a study of Satan because whether we recognize it or not, most of our thinking about Satan is an interesting hodgepodge of scripture and really fascinating and good British literature, which is to say the book Paradise Lost by John Milton has had a huge impact on how the general public thinks about Satan. So this is a, this is a topic, this is an idea where we need to drill down into scripture, drill down into our own thinking, and consider whether we've been influenced by scripture, some other source. And again, this is no hate on Paradise Lost. It is a great, great read, compelling read. So that in mind, here are some premises that I'm operating with. And again, some of this is review from Sunday with Durrell. The actual word, I'm not going to try to sit up here and act like I can pronounce Hebrew words. But the Hebrew word that's used for Satan was originally more description than proper title. So a couple examples of this. In Numbers 22, when... Balaam is on his way to do Balak's bidding. God sends one of his angels to be a Satan in front of Balaam. So he's going to go there and oppose what Balaam is trying to do. In 1 Samuel 29, David is on the run from Saul, and he takes refuge with the Philistines. 
But then the Philistines are about to fight Israel. And some of the Philistines, their commanders want to get rid of Satan or want to get rid of David, lest he become a Satan against them during battle. And then in 1 Kings 4, Solomon is enjoying the prosperity as he takes over the reign. And he sends word to the king of Tyre that God has given him rest. He has no Satan or misfortune. He has no opposition, no adversary or misfortune. So that was kind of the initial understanding. It's a description of someone who is an opposition or, as we maybe more commonly phrase it, an adversary. But Satan is also the name or title of a particular being. We talked about this on Sunday, Job 1. The Lord and one who's named Satan go back and forth about Job. And then in Zechariah 3, you see Joshua the high priest is standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan is accusing him. So it's a descriptive term. It's also the name and title of a particular being. And then from Revelation, which I know we covered on Sunday, <clears throat> Satan is the devil, is the serpent, is the dragon. And that's a helpful, instructive verse from Revelation 20 and verse 2. You can also see this idea if you go, are we just yanking that out and kind of expanding a point from John's revelation? No, this is also the case in the story of Jesus being tempted. When Jesus goes out to the wilderness and is tempted, some of the gospel writers will say it's Satan and the devil. Some will just use Satan. Mark is the one who uses just Satan. Luke just uses the word devil. Matthew uses devil and Satan to describe the same being in that. All right, so all of them on the screen at the same time. Started as a descriptive term, became a name or title of a particular being, and then goes by different words throughout throughout scripture. Comments, questions, concerns about these premises? All right, Genesis three. I'm gonna try to save us 15 minutes at the end of class to meditate on how Satan could be influencing us today. So we're gonna try to save some time. I'm gonna operate under the assumption that we're fairly familiar with Genesis three. So we're gonna pass over reading Genesis 3, and I just want you to recall the scenes. The woman has this interaction with the serpent. She winds up eating the fruit, <coughs> gives it to the man. God curses all the characters involved. Man and woman are expelled from Eden. And here's where I want us to start thinking and discussing together. Using only Genesis 1, 2, and 3, so recall all three chapters of Genesis, how would you describe the serpent's purpose, or we can say Satan's purpose, starting there in Genesis 3? Do you mean by purpose, do you mean his intent, or do you mean his purpose designated by God in the story? Let's say intent. Okay. What is his intent? Deception. Deception? Okay. What else? Deceiving. Deceiving? To thwart God's plan. To thwart God's plan? Okay. What else? Other ideas? Temptation. Temptation? Yes. That he is the tempter here in this passage. So we have deception, temptation, thwarting of God's plan. Any others? Well, he accuses God. Explain that. Yeah. How does he accuse God? Well, uh, what he's told you isn't true. And the idea is that God is somehow holding out from the man and the woman. They're like, there's something that he's withholding from them that they don't quite have. So all of these, all of these are good and they're helpful in thinking about his purpose. What I want to do briefly is just remember that mankind's purpose in Genesis 2 this is given to the man, and then it's expanded to the man and the woman. I love the image in Genesis 2. The idea of Eve being formed from Adam's rib is she's formed from his side. So mankind, man and woman, stand side by side for the purpose of working and keeping the garden within Eden. That's the image that we see in Genesis 2. And then when we think about the outcome, 
of Genesis 3, it's that the serpent's temptation eventually leads to mankind being cast out of the garden. So their purpose is to be in the garden, work the garden, keep the garden. Have We can go back to chapter 1 and say, have dominion over the garden. Rule it as God's delegates on earth. But by the end of the serpent's interaction with mankind, they're not even inhabiting the space that they're supposed to be ruling. And so we can say that the serpent's purpose is to oppose God's good intentions for mankind. The serpent's purpose is to oppose God's good intentions for mankind. So now, and we talked about this a little bit, how would you describe the serpent's tactics? How does the serpent go about opposing God's plan for mankind? <clears throat> So to twist the words of God, Seth, what were you going to say? Well, you see this after the, the cursing that God puts forth on man and woman, but God actually tries to protect Adam and Eve from, not at this point, but from what was going to be their mortality. Mm-hmm. And Satan uses that mortality to destroy them. Mm-hmm. What else? How would you describe how Satan operates his tactics here in Genesis 3? Well, he led them to believe they would know everything that God knew. Yeah, yeah. That they would know everything that God knew. And that leads to something that's really compelling to me in Genesis 3. Satan, the serpent, looks at Eve and says what about the fruit? You can eat it. And what happens? It'll make you wise. It'll make you wise, and even more, what else? It'll make you like God. Okay, it will make you like God. Now, I think this is a bit of dramatic irony from the writer of Genesis. What do we already know about male and female? Go back to chapter 1 of Genesis 3. They already have it in some respect. They already have it. The irony of this whole encounter is that Eve was already like God. And at least to some degree, at least to some degree, she also already knew good and evil. The serpent comes up, offers fruit, and she goes, nope. God said, that's not it. That is not how we are intended to live. So I think this is really interesting that Satan is trying to use what God has said to Adam and Eve. They're eventually called Adam and Eve. What he said to man and woman at this point, and he's trying to twist it so that man and woman will partake of God's creation in an abusive way. So that's how I try to think of the serpent's tactics here. The serpent, Satan, twists God's good gifts to be used in abusive ways. If you look at the description of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, It matches almost exactly the descriptions of the trees in the garden. The tree of knowledge of good and evil was part of God's good, beautiful creation. And Satan twists that so that Adam and Eve take it and partake of it in an abusive way. So that's where we get to kind of my working understanding of Satan the serpent as far as he's initially presented here in Genesis. And we'll just sit with this for a second. Satan animates, where he's the spirit behind, he's part of the cause of perpetual opposition to God's purposes. He does that by twisting the use of God's good gifts. We can think about this, the twisting of God's good gift as kind of a working definition of Sin, that sin oftentimes is taking something that God has given mankind for our good and using it and abusing it in a way that is ultimately destructive. And so this is Satan's tactic and opposing God's purposes is his intent. That's his purpose. Okay. Thoughts, ideas that are coming to your mind at this point? 
before <coughs> Satan arrives on the scene, before the serpent arrives on the scene, God's word is is um, the only thing that they have to to listen to. But it's when Satan first shows up and he says, oh, did God tell you? That's the first moment at which they would ever have any reason to question God's words. So I think basically one of the uh, functions that Satan performs over the millennia is to throw a question mark at us. Oh, did God say that? Mm -hmm. Well, here's something else for you to consider. That's helpful. That's helpful. To put a question mark where God has put a declarative statement. Yeah, that's a helpful way to phrase it. Thank you. Okay, now, I want us, if you're not already there, look at Genesis 3. And I want us to describe the conflict that is then introduced in Genesis 3, specifically when God is dealing out the curses. And I want us to look at how the text describes the conflict that will take place. What is the conflict that is going to take place now that the serpent has tempted man and woman? What's the conflict that arises? There will always be a struggle between good and evil. There we go. There's always going to be a struggle between good and evil. And where do we see that? What's the verse where we see that there's going to be some sort of struggle here between what we would eventually call good and <clears throat> evil because we know how the story plays out? What does the text say? Verse 15. There we go. Okay, verse 15. Look at verse 15. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel now we read that and see its ultimate fulfillment and rightly so in jesus but this establishes that there's going to be a conflict between the offspring or you probably have a footnote in your Bible that says the seed of woman, the offspring of the woman, and the seed or the offspring of Satan. Conflict will exist between the serpent's offspring and the woman's offspring. Now, again, I'm recognizing ultimately we see this fulfilled and we see the triumph fulfilled in Jesus, but <coughs> I think we wind up seeing the beginning of this conflict played out through the rest of Genesis. So the conflict is going to be between different offsprings. And interestingly enough, what's the very next story we get in Genesis? Cain and Abel. Cain and Abel. A story of two offsprings that are at odds with one another. So this is where I think the serpent has influence. The spirit of the serpent has influence throughout the rest of Genesis. And let's just kind of see how this plays out. Cain and Abel, we're familiar with this story. Cain falls to temptation in a way that is strikingly similar to Adam and Eve. But God comes in and he doesn't say there's a serpent who's there talking to you. What does, what does God tell, tell him? What's crouching and wants to rule over him. Someone said it. Sin. It's sin. So in a way, the serpent is animating that sin, that temptation that Cain is experiencing. Mankind's purpose, even when they are cast out of the garden, God tells them, go work the ground from which you were taken. That's verse 23 of chapter 3. And then do you remember one of the curses that God levies at Cain? The ground will no longer yield to you its strength. So Cain's purpose in Genesis 4 is messed up by his yielding to temptation, just like Adam and Eve's purpose was messed up in chapter 3 by their yielding to temptation. Okay, now this is where I think it gets really compelling. And it's one of those sections of Genesis that we might be quick to 
Skip. What comes next after the Cain and Abel story? Like right after it. <coughs> no. Before Noah. Babel. It's genealogy. It's genealogy. Okay. Genealogies are a list of offspring. Offspring. Cain's offspring leads to a guy named Lamech, who is a bad dude. Not a great guy. There in Genesis chapter 4. Cain's Lamech is violent. He practices polygamy. He's the first we see in the Old Testament. He takes justice and vengeance into his own hands. When God has said, that's not how this will work with Cain. So the spirit of Cain, the offspring, if you will, of the serpent, leads <coughs> to violence, oppression, responding, not even in kind, but in additional anger. He says, I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. But then in chapter 5, in chapter 5, we get another genealogy, another list of offspring that leads to a guy named Lamech. And who's his son? Who's his son? Skim chapter 5. No, no, Noah. Noah. What does Noah's name mean? Rest and comfort. There is a way to live in this world. There's a way to live in this world that we produce, that our offspring is violence, injustice, oppression, immorality. There is also a way to live in this world that brings about rest and comfort. And so here we're seeing through these genealogies, we're seeing an idea of which offspring will you align yourself with? Will you align yourself with the offspring of the serpent that leads to mankind's purposes being twisted and turned and violence being defined? Or will we align ourselves with the seed of woman who, again, will ultimately find its fulfillment in Jesus, but who brings rest, who renews mankind's purpose? Because then what we see is that this idea is picked up in after the flood with the line of Ham and the line of Shem. Ham's line in Genesis chapter 10, it's places like Egypt, Kalna, Assyria, Canaan. Shem's line leads to Abraham. Abraham's purpose is to bless the world. Ham's line, all almost of Israel's enemies. And again, the way, it's brilliant, the way the narrator is structuring these occurrences in Genesis give us an opportunity to think, will I align myself with the seed of woman or will I align myself with the seed of the serpent? And again, underlying, underlying all of this, all of the violence, all of the oppression is the spirit that we first saw in Satan in the garden. And if you just want to think about like, does that actually carry over through the rest of Genesis? Think about every single generation of the patriarchs, every single one of them, has some sort of conflict between brothers. All of them. All of them. Isaac and Ishmael, Jacob and Esau, Joseph and his brothers. Fascinatingly, every time the one who has done who has had a wrong done to them responds with grace and mercy. It's a fascinating story throughout Genesis to track these genealogies. And again, this spirit of Satan, this serpent-like quality, winds up undergirding so much of what we're seeing. So here's, here's the idea to maybe simplify it a little bit. I see you. Just a second, brother. When we align ourselves with the Canes of the world, with the Lamechs, the Nimrods, the Assyrians, the Canaans, we align ourselves all the way back to the beginning to the serpent. Or, to phrase this differently, we prove ourselves to be offspring of 
Satan. Now, offspring of Satan might clue us into um, a phrase that Jesus used against the Pharisees. That there is a way for us to operate in the world where we are acting, in a sense, as the son of Satan, the daughter of Satan. And that's where we're going to move on to this question in just a second. Yes, sir. Do you see a parallel then between that and Genesis 6, 4? Are we the sons of God and the daughters of men? I don't know. The candle burns. Can we talk about it afterwards? No, that's fine. Okay. <laughs> because I know Darrell talked about that on Sunday, so I don't know if I want to either oh, okay. disagree or... I wasn't here. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, that's fine. I wasn't either. I just watched it. Uh, I watched it on the way. I didn't watch it on the way home. I listened to it on the way on the way home from Indiana. Okay. I want to spend the last, we have 20 minutes left in class, thinking about how do we encounter Satan's tactics in our lives. Because remember, he, he, the servant goes to the background, but the way the narrative is structured, we're to think of when we see that violence and oppression from various characters, like they are aligning themselves with the serpent who's well in the background. And I want us to think, how do we encounter, how do I encounter, how do you encounter Satan's tactics in your life? And to hopefully open this up for some, some good discussion, I just want to testify about some experiences that, that I've had with busyness. With busyness. Um, I'm going to use some quotes from this book. It's called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry, How to Stay Emotionally Healthy and Spiritually Alive in the Chaos of the Modern World. I have it up here. If some of the quotes hit home and you want to flip through it or borrow it, feel free. But for a series of years, my job responsibilities <coughs> included full-time teaching. I was an English teacher at the time, which meant papers. I'm very thankful I don't have to grade papers anymore. I coached cross country and track that was essentially six days a week, all year round. I was the advisor for the school paper. I mentored WKU students who were becoming teachers every semester. There was an advocacy group that was promoting education through articles and different kinds of advocacy in the local paper. It was constantly going, constantly going. And on the surface, even to myself, if you said, how are you handling all of those responsibilities? I would have said I was handling it surprisingly well. I didn't feel overly stressed. I was hyper efficient. I valued at the time efficiency more than most other values in my life. I was having fun with these different responsibilities. But underneath the surface, underneath the surface, it was something more like this. I was just too busy to live an emotionally healthy and even more, a spiritually rich and vibrant life. I was missing a spiritually rich and vibrant life. Comer goes on to quote another author who describes this kind of living as hyper living, just skimming along the surface of life rather than enjoying the depths, the good depths of relationship, and especially relationship with God. Spiritual disciplines like reading and meditating on scripture, quiet time, prayer, fasting, they were non-existent because of the rapid pace of life. Not to mention that I had a very patient wife at home as well. And here's what I think we can see from Scripture and from the discussion that we have. I firmly believe behind that busyness was a satanic influence, full stop. And I, and I know how we're kind of trained to operate. We're trained to say, like, advising the paper and your job and coaching kids, like, those aren't bad things. But when I look at the busyness impact on my life, it was undoubtedly exerting a satanic, and remember, adverse, opposing influence 
on my spiritual well-being. So I cleared the deck of everything, except my job, except my job. Still holding that down. And when I'm asked to do extra stuff at work, like, do you want a cyber for this? No, thank you. What about a cyber? No, thank you. I had a, I had a colleague ask me three times, same day, Last week, are you sure you're not interested in doing this? There's a stipend available. And I was like, the third time I was like, for real, no, I just don't want to. That's not going to fit in. Here's how Comer talks about this pivot, away from hurry, away from busyness in his life. He said, I've accepted gratefully this, this more simple life that he decided to live. This is my life. There's death in that, true. But in the cruciform kingdom, only the bad things die. Image and status and bragging rights, they're all vanity. More importantly, death is always followed by resurrection. And again, this book is called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry by John Mark Comer. And what I've experienced in trying to see busyness as having exerted that kind of satanic, that adverse influence on my life is I have opened myself up by the grace of God to experience God more fully, more richly, because there's simply more time in my life to do that. And it's good. It has been really good. So let's open up and let's share. We have 13 minutes still left in class. I think it can be encouraging to hear what are things in your life that you can identify as having that kind of adverse, opposing impact. Anything that takes you away from God mm -hmm. is going to do that. Mm -hmm. Whether it's money, whether it's your job, you know, just, it doesn't make any difference. Mm -hmm. and the longer you live, the more you learn that. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a hard life to learn, but <laughs> it is. it's so true. You, uh, you stay time away from God, you, you just make a mistake. Mm -hmm. I, I love that line. That's a great way, that's a great takeaway from this class as a whole. And Darrell brought it up earlier. Like when, What Satan did so brilliantly is he just sowed a seed of doubt. Like, can I come in between the woman's thoughts and God? Can I stand in the way? And what you're saying is anything that does that can have this kind of impact. What else? What else have you experienced in your life that can have this kind of adverse Yes, uh, making me feel hopeless mm -hmm. about certain situations in my life um, and distracting me with hopelessness mm -hmm. where that I forget to pray about those things um, and to be encouraged by what God has to say about my life and where my life is headed and giving things to him fully. It's powerful, especially in a social media age where if you want to, if you want to, you can be inundated with bad all the time. And that can have an impact on the hope that we are, we're called to. What about Peter puts it? The living hope that we are, that we're called to. What else? What else can have an adverse impact on our lives? Accusations. Accusations? What kind of accusations? That we're doing something that we're not, or we are something that we're not, mm -hmm. or we think we're something that we're not. <laughs> can we can we pivot that into a discussion of guilt? Hey, what? Guilt. And thinking of how Satan uses guilt in our lives. I've heard it in Bible class, Bible classes before. People, and this is, this is heartbreaking to hear Christians talk about, talk about guilt in this way. I don't know if I've done enough in order to be saved. I don't know if I measure up in a way that would allow me to be saved. And I wish we would just keep what Paul says in Romans 8 at the forefront of our thinking. What does it say? There is therefore now... No what for those who are in Christ. There's no condemnation for those who are 
in Christ. And so frequently when we have those moments of guilt or doubt about our salvation, our answer to that starts in the wrong place. We start with, here's what I do, or here's what I have done. When those seeds of doubt and guilt creep in, it has to be, here's what Christ has done for me. And that's where we find our assurance. That's where we find, ultimately, our salvation. Yeah, Chip. You know, to kind of go along with your question up there, too, is, you know, I, I think about sometimes as, you know, Satan's tactics. You know, I, I feel like all of us, we underestimate how powerful Satan is. We think, well, you know, he's, he's, not, he's not getting to me. He's not doing anything to, to me. But he probably is. And we're just maybe looking the other way or we don't realize it's happening because it talks about in, um, you know, I, I think about in um, chapter 3 when it says, talks about him being crafty. And I think of that, how people become so powerful by being crafty. Even when you think they're not doing something, they, they are. And, you know, I think that's just a struggle for, you know, a lot of us is that, you know, we, we underestimate what he can do. And we don't think he's powerful enough to hit us in areas that we don't expect it. And then before you know it, we're so deep in sin. Yeah, that's helpful. And again, I think that's part of the part of the brilliant structure of the Genesis narrative. Is the serpent gone after chapter three? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. We're going to see. I'm thinking we're going to talk about this a little bit on Sunday. I'll just spoil it right now. Chapter twelve. Abraham, great man of faith. Some God glorifying, wonderful scenes from Abraham. Abraham is given this purpose. He's given this mission. You are to be a blessing for the nations. Great. All right. First interaction after that we see Abraham having with the nations. He goes down to Egypt, and what happens? He lies. He deceives Pharaoh. It sounds really familiar. He deceives Pharaoh. And instead of bringing the nations a blessing and a plague to Pharaoh. So there... We have this spirit of the serpent bringing about and using fear to thwart the purposes of God. Any others, how you encounter Satan's tactics in, in your life? Yeah. Going back to busyness, I think there can be layers to that. Um, you were talking about, there's a lot of things that I, I think that we do that we can not say no to. But I think there's also things that are put in our life that you can't say no to, but they still cause busyness. And you almost yeah. have to... Put them aside intentionally and and they can also like not even just but like they can cause so much overwhelming um, emotions in that in that, those moments that they they do the same thing and even though you can't say no to those things and yeah to be clear-minded about what our priorities truly are and to make sure like we are we are students of the word and we have hearts that are stirred by the proclaiming of this word so that we, we know those priorities so that we can then act them, we can act them out. Anybody else on this idea, how you encounter Satan's tactics in your life? Yeah. Going back to kind of putting a different spin on his craftiness, uh, something I read from C.S. Lewis years ago has stuck with me. He talks about how I think it's in the screw tape letters where says or anyway, Lewis talks about Satan likes to use whatever it is we're not looking at. And so, you know, growing up, the churches I attended liked to talk about homosexuality and you know, sleeping around and, and all these, you know, these big kind of big issues. But then I look in the church and I see divisions and I'm tempted to gossip and to, you know, uh, I, I, I'm tempted to, in a way, hate my brethren sometimes because of these divisions. And I think that's what Lewis is talking about. Well, he says as much is that we get, we get so focused on, well, I'm not, I'm not cheating on my wife or I haven't murdered anyone that we kind of lose sight of these things that we haven't done. And I've, I've done that myself. Anybody else? I think he does it a lot by trying to make us seek control. 
Mm. I know that's especially, I read a book once that said that's originally maybe what caused Eve to sin. He says, not that you'll become like God and that you will be beautiful or maybe even all-knowing or stuff like that. It's that she will know good from evil and be able to take control of her own life. Mm -hmm. And that's why part of her curse was losing some of her control. And um, it even kind of drew it up to Isaiah, Isaiah 1. Um, and God says, Therefore I will hedge up her way with thorns, and I will build a wall against her, so that she cannot find her paths. And she did not know that it was I who gave her the grain, the wine, and the oil. And he's just saying, I'm the only one that's in control. And Satan tries to keep telling us we can take it Yeah, and personality studies are wonky sometimes when personality tests are, but there's a personality type that wants to be in control to exert, just by the force of their personality, charisma, and will. They want to exert their will onto any given situation, and that can be maddeningly frustrating when we come to moments in life where it just can't happen, where it just can't happen, and we are overwhelmed by the recognition of the fact that we are finite. And there is one who is infinite, and he has asked us to put our faith in faith in him. Yeah. Anybody else? I think the serpent caused Eve to question God. And, and I, I think it's a good thing that, that sometimes when we, if we question things, it, you know, Paul uses arguments in a lot of his letters, rational arguments to help those that are questioned. But at the same time, if we question, we've got to know that we can question all we want, but what it is is what it is. And if Eve would have, you know, she, she was questioning her mind, but if she would have referred back, she said, well, no, God said that this is not, not good. It's not good. I don't understand it just yet, but it's not good. And that, that feeds into, I think, the brilliance of doing this what we're doing tonight and living out our Christian life in real community, not just like show up, my say what's up to Lawrence after his lesson, then we hit the door, but like existing in a community of believers, people who are more mature in the faith than we are, who can speak into our lives, who can answer those questions, who can hold us accountable. Like there is, there's such wisdom in being part of, being part of a family. All right, so again, to try to summarize some of this. The argument that I'm making about Genesis is that the serpent exerts influence from the background. From the background. That you see that kind of serpent-like mentality arise in characters like Cain, Cain's descendant, Lamech, and the sons of Ham throughout, and then all throughout the patriarchs as well. And what we're saying is we should be on guard for the temptations, for the opposition, for that adversary that operates from the background of our lives. But, but we can't, we can't have a lesson on Satan without recognizing that his head has been stomped on. His head has been stomped on. So here's the full sentence that I want us to use. Satan animates perpetual opposition to God's purposes by twisting the use of God's good gifts in ways that are ultimately self-defeating. In ways that are ultimately self-defeating. I worry sometimes about our perspective of the forces of evil. Satan, the forces of darkness that we studied on Sunday, all of them are defeated foes now, right now. They are defeated foes. We as believers, as people who have put our faith in Christ, are not operating from a sense of maybe we're going to win, maybe we're going to lose. We are operating from a position of strength and from a position of assured victory. This is, I'm studying, I'm mainly in the Matthew class right now, but this is the culmination of the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus looks at his people and says, all authority in heaven and on earth is mine. Go live that out. Go tell people that good news. 
that Satan's power has been contained by the blood of the Lamb and then by his resurrection as the line from the tribe of Judah. And as we go about trying to identify the tactics he used, Lawrence, Lawrence gave a great series of lessons where he was trying to instill in us the idea that sin is not my master. And we can add a punctuation to that. Sin is not my master because my master crushed his head. Thanks, everybody. See you on Sunday.